Hey, well, Merry Christmas this morning, whether you watch this by yourself, with the family, just a couple of you, however it is, Merry Christmas, we're glad you're with us, just want to sing a carol together, and then Dan's going to kind of read through the Christmas story at together, so sing this with us, wherever you're at. One, two, three. Christmas. Uh, my name is Dan. I'm the campus pastor here at the Norton Campus of Grace Church. And from my wife Jennifer and myself and the entire staff team and their families here, we just want to wish you a very Merry Christmas and we hope you have a Happy New Year. And I want to say this. Thank you for allowing me to kind of barge into your Christmas day today. And so appreciate the opportunity. Um, some of you are experiencing Christmas with your family, some with friends. Uh, maybe some of you have kids and they're thinking, how long do we got to listen to this bald guy before we can jump into our presence? Uh, others of you, maybe it's a whole different rhythm this year. I don't know. Maybe for some of you, this is your first Christmas being married. And so you and your wife or husband, you're trying to figure out a whole new rhythm. Uh, I hope for some of you, it's the first Christmas where your kids just become aware of how exciting it is. And that's eh, the truth is for some of you, um, it's a disappointing Christmas. Maybe it's different because someone's missing from the picture. Wherever you're at in that, thank you for allowing me to be a part of your Christmas tradition and Christmas morning this year. Um, I don't know about you, but I shared this a few weeks ago. Tradition and routine was something, you know, I grew up with. There were certain things we did every Christmas. Um, I don't know what yours is, but ours Christmas Eve growing up, uh, we always had oyster stew. I shared that in a service here. Nothing says Merry Christmas quite like a slimy oyster in some soup, right? But we'd always share that as a family. And then uh, if there was a good Christmas movie on, well, we didn't have VHS, man. I grew up in the mountains. So if there was a Christmas movie that was on one of the two channels that we got in the mountains, we'd sit and watch it. Uh, if no Christmas movie was on, play games, uh, do something like that. But then you went to bed as a kid and I declare it was the longest night ever uh, because you didn't sleep much 
And then when finally morning began to roll around and you thought, I wonder if we can just coax dad out of bed a little earlier this year, right? Any of you have that experience, right? My dad then, he was always the last one to get up. I thought he did it on purpose, always last. But then we had a routine, a tradition. And uh, part of his tradition, part of the way it rolled out for us was he would read the Christmas story and then we would make some comments on it. Um, this year, my mom and dad are uh, both in heaven. They're both with Jesus. Uh, they're having their greatest Christmas ever. Uh, they're in the presence of Jesus. But I wonder if this year you would let me in your Christmas kind of take the place of my father. And I wonder if we could read the Christmas story. Very familiar, I'm sure, to most of you. Maybe you've heard it before. It goes like this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph, he went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him. She was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in claws and placed him in a manger because there was no room available for them in the inn. Uh, you probably heard that story before and you would agree with me, that sounds quaint, it sounds serene, it sounds beautiful, it sounds like the makings of a Christmas movie. Uh, we've been saying it this way here, like a lot of times we can read that and we read that almost like it's a precious moment story, almost like it's a Hallmark movie. But when I read that, if you'll just let it be raw and real for a second, it's a birth story. Like a child came on the scene. And if you're a parent, you already know this, there's nothing quaint and serene about the birthing of a child, let alone the raising of a child. A baby, a baby, particularly your first baby, is gonna change your world. My wife and I found that out. We have three kids, but our first child, his name's Joel, uh, there was a pretty steep learning curve. Everything for us was fine. It was great. As long as we were in the hospital and there was like 40, 11 different nurses helping us take care of him. But the moment they cut us loose, we didn't live near our parents, about 10 hours away. Uh, the moment they cut us loose and sent us home, uh, I was thankful my mother-in-law was there at the time. Because I remember thinking to myself, we got home with this child, one child. We only added one little baby to the mix and everything changed. I remember thinking, how does anyone work a job with a baby? <laughs> you ever think that? Like, it felt like all we did was change diapers, wash bottles, fill bottles, hold him while he cried, then change diapers, wash bottles, fill bottles, hold him while, like, it felt like continuous nonstop, and there were three adults in the house. I, was, I remember thinking to myself, how does someone do this? A baby, just one little baby changed our world. I remember the night, my mother-in-law was still in town and we thought, we're gonna brave it, we're gonna go out to eat, we want some normalcy, and so we're gonna go to our favorite Mexican restaurant. And so we decided to go, we're gonna brave it, put him in a car seat, all bundled up, and we get to the restaurant, it's gonna be great, can't wait for the chips and the salsa, get our favorite dish, all that kind of stuff. And we sat down in the booth, the three of us adults and this one baby. And that baby rocked our world and he rocked that entire restaurant the entire night. We took turns, Jennifer starts in the bathroom holding the screaming baby while we enjoyed chips and salsa. Then it was Mary Jane's turn. She held the screaming baby in the bathroom, out in the lobby, while Jennifer and I enjoyed the eating together. And then it was my turn. We just took shifts all night long. That baby changed our world. You know something? I think that very much was the case with Mary and Joseph. This was their firstborn. That had to be a steep learning curve for them. Uh, the, the baby that we just read about, I think changed their world. Like, I think it was real, I think it was raw. I'm not sure I buy the no crying he makes. I'm just saying, I think the baby changed their world. But what made that baby that first Christmas really, really unique, really, really special, was something that God had let them know, and that is this, that that baby they had that night in that passage we just read, didn't just change their world. That that baby born that night in that obscure setting was gonna change the world. I love this little writing that someone wrote that says this, he, speaking of Jesus, was born in an obscure village. 
He was the child of a peasant, grew up in another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book, he never held an office, he never had a family or owned a home. He didn't go to college, he li never lived in a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. Then he was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his garments the only property he had on this earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. 21 centuries, the author says, have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race. I'm well within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. Speaking of Jesus. I think the author saying this, saying what we just alluded to, that that baby that changed their world, that baby is a baby who was going to change the world. See, that baby grew up to become a man. And that baby became a man, and he became the subject of God's most famous greeting card. We don't often associate it with Christmas, but I think it's his most famous Christmas greeting card. Maybe you've heard it. It goes something like this. It starts for God. What do you think of when I say that? What comes to your mind when I say for God? No matter how big you think that God is, he's bigger. No matter how wise you just thought he was, he's wiser. Like he is the creator that spoke and it came into being. Nothing is impossible for him. He is all wise. There's nothing beyond his ability to comprehend. He's everywhere present. That God who created, that God for whom nothing is impossible, it says, for that God so loved. He didn't just love like you love Christmas. He didn't just love like you love ice cream. He didn't just love like my dad loved oyster stew, right? He, he didn't just love, he so loved. Like it is a emphatic love, it is a targeted love, it is an intentional love. Can we say this? That that God so loved, it's an extravagant love. For God so loved the world. The world, the cosmos, the people who make up the population of the world, past, present, future, he so loved them. Guess what? For God so loved the world, and that includes you. In fact, you ought to put your name in there. For God so loved Dan, you put your name in there, that he gave. God loves to give. How many of you at Christmas time, you love to get gifts, but you love to give? God loves to give. He so loved the world, he so loved you, that he decided intentionally, purposefully, to pick out a gift that would just be right for you, that you needed. What was that gift? It was the baby that changed the world. Because for God so loved the world, you, that he gave his one and only son. That when Jesus came, was born in a manger, that was God's gift. And that gift, the baby born in the manger that was going to change their world, was going to grow up to be a man to change the world because he was going to die on a cross. He's going to die for our sins, for your sins and my sins. And that's why it says, for God so loved the world, that includes you, that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him, that whoever says yes to him as Savior, Lord and King, that whoever believes that Jesus, when he died, died for their sin. He died for your sin. He died for my sin. He died for all the things that you regret, all the things you're guilty of, all the things no one else knows, all the things that you have trouble in your mind getting past. He knows, and he so loves you that Jesus came. And for those who would believe that that Jesus, that baby, now grown up Jesus, died for them, for them, 
They don't need to perish. But they can have eternal life. They can have an abundant life for eternity. That's how you ought to read that. That's how much God loves you. You see, here's what I know. This Christmas, you probably look over. Go ahead, look over to your tree. Where's it at in your room? And do you see it? You probably have some gifts, maybe a gift, maybe some gifts under there. I don't know. You're going to open those gifts maybe in a minute. Maybe you've already opened them. But what God wants you to see this Christmas is that he has a tree. It happens to be the tree on which they hung Jesus. And under that tree is a gift with your name on it. It's the gift of his love. I would suggest there's gifts of his love. It's found in Christ. It's found in Jesus. And this Christmas it has your name on it. One of those gifts that his love offers you because of what Jesus did on the cross is the gift of forgiveness. That no matter what you've done, what you regret, what you're ashamed of, no matter what is in your life, there is the gift of forgiveness because Jesus took your place. There's also the gift of belonging. Did you open that gift? That God's love offers us the gift of belonging to the family of God. That when we say yes to Jesus, we are called a child of God. He gave his only son so that we could be sons and daughters of God. Call him father. Belonging to the family. Our identity in him. Not only is there the gift of forgiveness and the gift of belonging, but do you know what else there is there? There's the gift of hope. Anybody out there need some hope? Yeah. The hope that there's more to life than just this life. The hope that there's more than just the here and now. The hope that is anchored in Jesus right now for eternity. And those gifts are under the tree for you. And God's invitation to you this Christmas is that you leave none of the gifts that he offers because of his love found in Christ unopened. That you would open those gifts. For some of you, for the first time, the truth is, for the first time, to say yes to Jesus as your Savior and Lord. For others of you, you've opened that gift, but somewhere along the way, you've lost hope. You've lost the sense of belonging. Maybe this Christmas, before you open any of the gifts under your tree, you need to go back and reopen and re-understand and re-wear and re-appreciate the gift of God, the God who so loves you, that he gave his only son, Jesus, so that whoever, that includes you, would believe in him, doesn't need to perish, but can have eternal, abundant life. I'd love to pray with you this Christmas. I would say if you're there with your family, it'd be very appropriate. Why don't you grab hands around the room together? If you're there with your spouse, just grab each other's hands. And some of you, I know, you're alone this Christmas. Can I be your family? Can we just grab hands virtually in this moment? Father, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you that you love me. And if you're praying with me, why don't you just say that? I thank you that you love me so much that you sent Jesus to die for me in my place and that I can, because of Christ, open the gift of your forgiveness, the gift of belonging to your family, and the gift of a forever hope that nothing can take away. I love you. I trust you. And we need you. And we're so thankful for Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Merry Christmas to you. I hope you have a wonderful day together. I love you guys. Take care.